Have you ever thought about what's wrong with segments? Is there anything wrong with them at all? What could be done better or differently with AI? Stick around and find out. We're going to go into a deep dive into what segments do and what they don't do in findings and theories in a push for a fully vectorized translation environment. Hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have a pretty good understanding of what a fully vectorized translation environment means, what a vector is, what an embedding is, and at the same time, open your mind in terms of a few different things that could be done with text and language. So first, let's talk about the critique around segments, right? And I want to acknowledge segments are amazing. Segments are what enabled uh, the, all the growth towards the globalization in our sector over the past 40 years. Segments are were able to package information as source and target in a very relational structured way. And then from that could find similar matches as translation memory matches in other structured databases called translation memories, which are storing these things as units. So the, the segment is a critical core component of localization. It enables reuse, it enables repetition, it enables consistency, it enables productivity checks, Segments are amazing, right? I don't want to say that segments are bad. The challenge is that they're built for syntax driven operations, not for semantic driven operations. But what do I mean by that? So AI in its vectorized and embedded form is really all about very complex relationships between text and between different structures, linguistical structures. When we take a look at syntax comparatively, it's a lot simpler in terms of, for instance, when we look for a translation memory match, we're looking for small deviations in characters called Levenstein edit distances between the source and whatever is stored in the translation memory. When we look at AI, AI is so broad that, for instance, an embedding in theory, you could, you could cross-correlate an embedding in Japanese with an embedding in, in Portuguese. Portuguese, you could cross-correlate the embedding in text form with the embedding in language form, in, in uh, photo form, in audio form. So the embedding is uh, by design uh, modal agnostic, it's just, it's a vector, and you can do so much with it, right? And when we're trying to fit it into these very finite discrete amounts of information, it's like retrofitting a fire hose through kitchen pipes, right? The, the kitchen pipes are the segments. They're really small and, and, and the AI is really just a fire hose, right? And, and that's kind of the challenge that we face when we try to do something with segments. And when we look at this difference, right? A traditional relational database has the sentence, for instance, John has gone to the store and has also the sentence, John went to the supermarket. From a proposition or meaning perspective, they both say the same thing. There's a person, who went in the past to a place where they buy things, right? The store, the supermarket went and has gone, very similar things. From a syntax perspective, these sentences are very different. So if we were to look for a translation memory match between these sentences, we wouldn't be able to find one. But that's the definition of a traditional relational database. Now, when we look at a vector database, John has gone to the store versus John went to the supermarket, those sentences have similarities in vectors and small deviations in those vectors and those embeddings, which means that we can identify more clearly that there is a correlation in meaning between these different structures. And I do want to point out that traditional relational databases in AI, you can do a lot with it within tools like BureauWorks. You can increase your productivity very significantly, but the challenge is there's a lot of talk, and for good reason, the space of how translation is becoming one with content creation. How more and more people that aren't previously exposed to translation do need to translate, do want to translate, do want to author. And in that sense, the vector databases are a lot more compatible with the entire AI paradigm in which we are. So going back to our challenge as an industry is that we still need glossaries. We still need precise knowledge leveraging, QA checks, all of this apparatus that was built over the past 40 years. But we also need to extract maximum value from the AI. In that context, we're at a crossroads, right? We're in a conundrum. Segments are great, but they're also prison. And this is a very interesting part, at least for me, is that the segments, they stimulate a lot more... Um, predictable behavior in my end. And for many, many years, that's what people wanted from translators. They wanted that predictable behavior. They wanted that consistency. That was the hard thing to have when you have completely different humans and completely part of the different parts of the world working together. Now it's kind of the opposite. Now it's kind of like we have to re-add the human spice back to all of this predictability that are enabled by large language models and technology. So 
Stick around and you'll understand exactly why segments are great, but they're also a prison. Let's talk about what a vector is, right? A vector is a numeric fingerprint that rep represents the meaning of something like a sentence or image so that a computer can compare it to others, right? So in this context, a vector is just like a list of numbers, like with five dimensions, for instance, but just so you have an idea, the, um, the vector database that we're using has 1,536 dimensions. So that's a lot of dimensions, a lot of different ways in which you can pinpoint exactly what information that vector is representing. So when we look at vector search, the key difference is that compared to relational searches where we're looking at very one-to-one -one correspondences between something that's stored versus something that's being queried for, in a non-structured approach, we're able to find, for instance, that camels, dogs, whales have certain similarities between them because they're mammals and they're very different from a chair and basketball and books, which do have other similarities in them because they're objects. And maybe the book has another similarity with other things that are proximal to it. So when we look for things, we think about it in my, my mind, the easiest way to think about it is like a very large spatial 3D cube where things are positioned in information is positioned in a way where you're not just looking at the information itself, you're able to look at a concept called the nearest neighbor, right? So when we're looking for information, you can you both have the storing step where you're storing things like images, like audio, like documents in this non-structured database that gets transformed into embeddings in this process. So in this case, for instance, you can see here an illustration of a bull and an illustration and a text of the bull, maybe a sound of the bull. So different things that all represent that bull. And then that bowl and all of those things get transformed into embeddings, and those embeddings are what are stored in this, this vector database. Now, when we retrieve that in the vector database, we type in a, a query, for instance, the bowl by Pablo Picasso. That query is transformed into embeddings, into vectors, and then we look for the nearest neighbors for those things, and we find, we're able to find, oh, there's an audio that talks about the bowl. There's a painting that depicts the bull. There's a text that talks about the bull, and those are the results that we would see. So it's a much less structured way of storing and retrieving that information. And when we talk about vector-based architecture outside the large language model is that with AI embeddings you, in, in translation, you can preserve meaning across languages while maintaining terminology precision. So if you think about it, right, we're thinking about on one hand, the large language model is able of doing all these very powerful and rich references between different sources of information. On the other hand, typically a large language model is going to be very abstracted from a linguistic corpus. Even if you feed it context, you won't ex exactly understand exactly where it's using that context versus another context, for instance, why it's making a, a decision of a certain word choice. You could prompt it, it could explain something to you, but you won't know from, let's say, a programmatic perspective or from a, from a uh, very far from a deterministic perspective, you'll have very little governance around that. Now, when we look at what this allows and what this enables is a tremendous cross-functional creation interface. So in this case, for instance, because you're working seamlessly across different modalities, you could start, for instance, with a, the description of a, it could be, the source could be, for instance, just a description of a company or a product. And from that source, maybe you can create a tweet. From that source, maybe you can create an email. Maybe from, from that source, you'll create a landing page. And you don't need any more than one-to-one -one correspondence. And still, you're able to maintain some level of correspondence between that source as a guiding vector, as a guiding direction. So that eliminates the technical barriers that kept marketers and creatives out of the translation process, enabling collaborative adaptation. So it's super powerful, right? So for a long time, when translations were over, that's when, for instance, a process of cultural adaptation began or legal adaptation. And maybe, you know, the original had one disclaimer, the, the translation in a certain country had 10 disclaimers and another country had zero disclaimers. Maybe the language changed, maybe the copy changed. And all of that had to happen typically outside translation management systems because they weren't built for that, right? They weren't built for that level of adaptation. And as much as you could add a segment here or there, again, you're retrofitting something and, and you then create all kinds of other derivative problems from that. Now, in this vectorized environment, a few beautiful things happen. Obviously, as I mentioned, you don't need any more source target strictness. You can have a suggestion of an idea that then gets translated into a poem, a tweet, a post, even a video, right? So that could be that 
that in itself is looser. And sure, large language models do that by design. The difference is that companies need to be able to do that at scale in a really predictable way, in a really collaborative way. They still need to pay people. They still need to account for quality. They still need to manage processes. And that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the intersection of all these things. The other thing that I say as a provocation, we can start from the target. Why? Because translations are getting pretty reliable. And sure, you find issues here and there. Some things aren't, aren't expressed um, as well or as neatly as they could. There are slight deviations in meaning. But you have agents that can pick up on that kind of deviation. And it's fairly simple for you to start from the target and really work from that part on. So when a lot of people think that like translation will be done because of AI, I couldn't disagree further than that because what is, in my opinion, going to happen is that the benchmark for what translation looks like is going to change. Translations are going to be way more nuanced, way more adapted, way more um, customized for that exact use case. So in that sense, you can start from the target without worrying so much about the source. And perhaps the most beautiful part is that it doesn't have to be a linear process anymore. So with vectorized translation environments, you can, for instance, make a change towards the end of the file that's going to impact the file as a whole. Whereas in the segment by segment base, it's extremely linear. Maybe in segment 78, you made a change that impacted segment 54. There's no way that the translation management system will know that and will be able to interact with that in a nonlinear way. It's extremely structured by design. So this transforms the entire localization process from a technical one into a creative one without sacrificing speed or consistency. And I think for me, the most important part of what we believe that this movement goes towards is freedom. And when we talk about freedom, I think about authorship and I think about how AI has already changed really fundamentally the way I think about my own writing, the way I welcome my own mistakes, my own quirks, my own issues, because they're what make me me. And, you know, in a pre-AI reality, maybe I would worry more about a spelling mistake, about a grammar mistake. Now, I think it's those mistakes, quote unquote, that precisely make the expression mine. I don't want to just flatten out my expression so that I speak like a model. I want to speak like me. So authorship, in my opinion, is going to be one of the most scarce things out there with the advent of AI as it continues to evolve. People are going to really um, look, be really thirsty for things that feel authentic, things, things that feel genuine, things that feel human. And, and it's a really fine line, right? I'm not saying that things need to be authored 100% by a human to feel human. In my opinion, you could work with AI. And if you, if, if you know what you're doing, you can create a very human uh, output, even if you're leveraging it. But you need to know exactly where and how to intervene. You need to have a very clear vision of what you want to accomplish. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a space where people and machines can collaborate in a way that really um, and emphasizes and enhances their creativity, their thoughts, their perceptions, their feelings, their intuition. Because ultimately, in my opinion, the two key skills that are really necessary in any subject matter in order to succeed during the coming years are basically come down to two things. One is creativity and the other is resilience. And I think that anybody that's very creative or strives to build on their creativity and is really resilient, and by resilience I mean don't don't people that don't give up, people that are willing to change, people that are willing to stick with it. If you ally those things together, I think you're in a great position to really succeed incredibly with what's about to come. So in my opinion, there are great things about to come, not only in bureau works but in the world in general. They are highly dependent though in our attitude towards these things. So thank you so much for watching. If you have any comments, please leave them below. Again. Really appreciate all of your viewership and till next time. Take care. Bye bye.